Hello everyone, my name is Marina Davies and today I will be presenting my master's project evaluating the effects of land use on riparian corridors in Sonoma County. To start my presentation, I will first go over background information on riparian ecosystems and my study area. Then I will go over my research objectives and questions. I'll explain the methods I use to answer my research questions and the results I found from my research. I will conclude my presentation with recommendations for future work. So what are riparian ecosystems? Riparian ecosystems are transitional zones between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. As transitional zones, riparian ecosystems typically consist of hydrophytic vegetation or water-loving plants, productive soils, and wildlife and vegetation communities that are adapted to flooding and droughts. Currently, Riparian ecosystems occupy about 2% of the total landscape in the western U.S. Despite their small size, these ecosystems encompass a mosaic of diverse landforms, wildlife, and vegetation communities. Why should we care about riparian ecosystems? Well, riparian areas provide several ecosystem services that are essential for aquatic, terrestrial, and human communities. These services include Enhancing water quality by removing pollutants from entering streams, which is vital to drinking water supplies and local wildlife. Riparian areas also support a diversity of vegetation species, which provides habitat for aquatic and terrestrial wildlife. Riparian vegetation sequesters carbon and provides shade to adjacent streams, which maintains stream temperatures. Additionally, riparian vegetation stabilizes stream banks and reduces excessive sediment input into streams. Finally, riparian ecosystems provide recreational activities to local residents, such as fishing, boating, and wildlife viewing. However, the health and function of riparian ecosystems are impacted by several threats. Alteration to natural riparian landscapes due to agriculture, timber harvest, industrialization, and urban expansion have modified or completely removed native riparian vegetation. This has led to stream bank instability and loss of wildlife habitat. Additionally, mining and dam construction contribute to excessive sediment deposited into streams. And finally, pollution from upland non-point sources threaten aquatic, terrestrial, and human communities. One method to combat the threats against riparian ecosystems is to implement riparian conservation practices. Typically, these practices recommend the installation or protection of an existing riparian corridor. In most cases, riparian protection is regulated through local zoning ordinances. These ordinances designate a fixed or varied distance adjacent to a stream where land use activities are restricted in order to protect riparian ecosystems. If riparian habitat is absent, these riparian corridors may be used to achieve a desired function, such as enhance water quality. Riparian corridor distance correlates with riparian functions. For example, the distance needed to enhance wildlife habitat is generally much larger than the distance needed to stabilize banks. While riparian corridors are used throughout the world, there is no one-size-fits-all guideline, allowing local management agencies to decide what would best suit the needs of their site. A large portion of Sonoma County falls within the Russian River watershed, which encompasses about 1,500 square miles of drainage area. It is characterized as a Mediterranean climate with warm summers and mild wet winters. The watershed is of local importance as it supplies over half a million people with drinking water. Additionally, it is home to native wildlife species, such as the coho salmon, which is listed as federally endangered. The main threats to riparian habitat throughout the watershed and Sonoma County is agriculture and urban development. The Riparian Corridor Combining Zone is an ordinance in Sonoma County that was adopted in 2014 and is regulated by the Sonoma County Permit and Resource Management Department. The objective of this ordinance is to protect and enhance riparian corridors along designated streams while also balancing economic developments. This ordinance regulates a fixed width distance that prohibits land use activities within these conservation areas. Generally, the distance is determined based on stream and land use type. 
However, the distances are approximate to allow for parcel specific considerations based on the location of top of higher bank, existing riparian vegetation, and slope and soil types. For my master's project, I wanted to answer two main questions. What are the potential effects of land use on riparian ecosystems in Sonoma County? And how does the Riparian Corridor Combining Zone Ordinance compare to scientific literature recommendations for riparian corridors? To answer my research questions, I conducted a literature review and synthesis of peer-reviewed articles and government reports. I obtained current land use data from the Farmland Mapping and Monitoring Program to determine the dominant land use types in Sonoma County. From the literature review, I compared the impacts of various land use types on riparian ecosystems. Finally, I compared the Riparian Corridor Combining Zone Ordinance to recommendations from the literature review to evaluate if the Sonoma County Zoning Ordinance is successfully achieving a balance between natural resource protection and economic needs. Out of the 1 million acres within Sonoma County, agriculture and urban development are the most dominant land use types. Therefore, for my project, I focused on studying the impacts of agriculture and urban development on riparian ecosystems. Historically, Stream channelization and straightening have been used to create flat, farmable land near the edges of rivers and streams. This has led to increased stream bank erosion. Additionally, livestock grazing creates compact soils, which slows the percolation of water and increases the rate of surface water runoff. This in turn increases surface erosion and adds fine sediment into adjacent streams. Runoff from agricultural land often contains pesticides, nutrients, pathogenic microbes, sediment, and agricultural products. In January of 2020, a winery accidentally spilled up to 96,000 gallons of wine into tributaries that lead to the Russian River, pictured here in the bottom right corner. Physically removing or altering native riparian vegetation to plant exotic species such as orchards and plantations transforms the structurally complex riparian vegetation community into a uniform vegetation pattern composed of one crop species. Finally, the effects of reduced habitat and poor water quality threaten wildlife species that rely on riparian ecosystems. The reduced habitat increases the risk of predation and poor water quality threatens the survival of riparian wildlife. Similar to agriculture, urban development increases stream bank erosion through stream channelization and increased runoff from impervious surfaces. Impervious surfaces are any hard surface material, such as concrete, asphalt, rooftops, or roads. These surfaces limit infiltration, reduce groundwater recharge, and increase runoff. This leads to increased erosion and sediment input into streams. Additionally, Runoff from urban areas often contain excess nutrients, herbicides, pharmaceuticals, microbial contaminants, and litter, which impairs water quality. In urban areas, there is also generally a reduction in native vegetation communities due to the presence of invasive plant species. Invasive plant species are introduced through seed dispersal from nearby green spaces and stormwater runoff. Once introduced, these invasive plant species rapidly colonize and dominate riparian ecosystems and urban landscapes. Finally, urban development impacts wildlife through channel modification, poor water quality, increased predation, and invasive species. The riparian functions that I studied were temperature control, sediment control, enhanced water quality, and enhanced diversity in habitat for aquatic and terrestrial wildlife. From the literature review, I found that there is a wide variability in optimal riparian corridor width for each function. For example, the optimal width recommended to support terrestrial wildlife ranged from 98 to 5,239 feet. This highlights that there is not a one-size-fits-all design for riparian corridors. However, a general consensus from the literature review indicated that wider corridors are considered most effective in optimizing riparian functions. Additionally, when designing riparian corridors, the width should be dependent on vegetation, local climate, topography, hydrology, 
stream order, soil characteristics, and adjacent land use. Therefore, it is important for local management agencies to assess the conditions of their site to adequately protect riparian ecosystems. The Riparian Corridor Combining Zone Ordinance created setback distances based on stream category and land use type. Any new development has a setback distance of 200, 100, or 50 feet. For new agricultural sites, this distance is reduced to 100, 50, and 25 feet. The reduced setback distance was accepted to gain the support of agricultural groups who originally opposed the adoption of this ordinance. While there is inconsistency in setback requirements, these distances are approximate to allow for parcel specific considerations. When compared to scientific recommendations, the ordinance implements riparian corridor widths within the range recommended by various studies. However, these setback distances are in the lower range of recommendations. For example, the minimum setback distance for new agricultural cultivation is 25 feet, which meets the optimal width recommendation for reducing sediment, but not for stream temperature control, enhanced water quality, or enhanced diversity in habitat for aquatic and terrestrial wildlife. Therefore, some of the setback distances regulated do not meet the minimum widths recommended to optimize all riparian functions. In conclusion, I found that agriculture and urban development pose a threat to riparian ecosystems. Both land use types influence stream bank erosion, facilitate poor water quality, alter native riparian vegetation, and threaten riparian wildlife. However, there isn't enough evidence to identify which land use type is more detrimental than the other. Comparing the Riparian Corridor Combining Zone Ordinance to scientific recommendations, it was found that the Riparian Corridor Combining Zone implements setback distances within the range of recommended distances for some of the riparian functions. However, the setback distances either fell within the lower range of the recommendations or did not meet the optimal width to achieve certain riparian functions. The synthesis of literature and evaluation of the riparian corridor combining zone ordinance have led to several recommendations for Sonoma County. First, an assessment of the quantity and quality of riparian habitat is necessary to identify critical areas that are in need of higher protection. Understanding the current condition of riparian habitat in Sonoma County will provide landscape level considerations which are often absent in site specific guidelines. This assessment can be done using GIS and remote sensing techniques or the California rapid assessment method. Both techniques are cost efficient and can be used to determine the health of riparian areas in Sonoma County. One of the many reasons riparian regulations tend to fall short is because the benefits of riparian ecosystems are often overlooked or unknown. I recommend increased public outreach for the community and local planners. Increased knowledge about the benefits of riparian ecosystems may likely influence the community's opinion to adopt riparian protection measures. Finally, incentive programs for private landowners who wish to implement riparian management practices on their property should be introduced to residents of sonoma county there are various programs residents can utilize such as the conservation reserve program the wildlife habitat incentive program and the california wetlands reserve program these programs provide financial or technical assistance for landowners who are willing to manage their riparian areas on their property. Finally, a new riparian corridor policy based on science is necessary to adequately protect and enhance riparian ecosystems. Inconsistency in riparian management regulations due to economic reasons is a major challenge for implementing riparian corridors throughout the U.S. While the setback distances in the riparian corridor combining zone are approximate to allow for parcel specific considerations, I recommend a new policy that is consistent for all land use types and considers the optimal width needed to achieve various functions. In conclusion, to further protect and enhance riparian areas in Sonoma County, I recommend an assessment on the conditions of riparian habitat, increasing public education on the benefits of riparian ecosystems, 
informing landowners about incentive programs, and formulating a new policy based on science. I would like to thank my master's project advisor, Professor Aviva Rossi, for her guidance and never-ending support. And thank you all for listening to my presentation.